Do you want to have sex? What, really? Forget it. No, um, yeah, okay. Are you sure? Yeah, I thought, you know, we were. I know, but fuck it, let's just do it already. Yeah, okay, fuck it. Ouch. Sorry. Are you sure that's, like, the right angle? I think so. Just, slower, maybe. Okay, does that feel better? No, it's still. Sorry, I think, I'm... Wait, are you all ready? Hannah's prompt response to my text message sent a wave of relief through me. I needed someone to talk to and, fortunately, she was a night owl. I crawled out of bed, careful not to wake Aaron, and quietly closed the door behind me. I then headed downstairs to the kitchen, where I poured myself a glass of water and tapped Hannah's name on my cell phone. What's up? I just want to talk. No, you're usually asleep by now. Something must have happened. I sighed. So, yeah, something did happen. Let me guess, since your mom's away, Aaron's there overnight. Am I correct so far? Yes. Did you two have a fight? No, nothing like that. Well, what is it? I cleared my throat and took a deep breath. So, you know those movies you like, with the masked killers slashing up teens? Maria, if Jason Voorhees is in your house, hang up and get the fuck out of there. I rolled my eyes. No, so, you know how you always joked about how I'd be the one person in our friend group who'd survive one of those movies. Let's just say my odds just went way down. Aaron's too. Oh, so you two finally. Yes. Okay, first of all, that's awesome, and you have my full support, and I hope it was fucking great. But weren't both of you, like, pretty serious about the whole waiting for marriage thing? We were. So what happened? I shrugged. We were, like, an hour into a makeout session, and it just kind of happened. It was my idea. I thought he'd argue with me, or even scold me for suggesting it. But instead he just went right along with it. Is he with you now? No, I left him upstairs. He passed out almost immediately afterwards. I couldn't sleep. Maria, I'm honored your first thought was to call me, assuming your plan isn't for me to bore you into tiredness. I chuckled. No, I just have a lot of thoughts swimming around in my head. I can't settle. I figured that laying them out with you might help, though I'm not sure where to start. You don't have to go into it in any detail if you don't want to, but, like, how was it? It was awkward. You expected it not to be. I don't know. I had no idea what to expect. I don't know much about these things. Part of it was how, after all that buildup, over three years, considering we've been together since the end of high school, it didn't exactly feel great, and it was over so fast. I'm still processing it. Hannah gave a gentle laugh. It's okay, Maria. Really, so many people have experiences just like yours. It was like that with me too, you know. Jose and I had no idea what we were doing at first. And guess what? It got better and we have fucking amazing sex now. Just give it some time and always communicate how you feel. Aaron's a good guy. He'll listen. I took a deep gulp of water before responding. Thanks. I hope you're right. Had you two been doing, like, other stuff before? You've never mentioned anything like that. That's because there wasn't much to talk about. We'd barely done more than kiss. Jesus, something sure fucking came over you tonight. I guess. I wanted him so badly. I also thought, you know, how often are we going to have the whole place to ourselves, with no risk of being interrupted? Even then, I still thought he'd say no, or I'd change my mind at the last moment, but neither happened. Oh, I get it. 100%. I do need to ask. You used, you know. Yeah. We're not that clueless. I know where mom keeps a box of them. She's not going to notice one missing. Gotcha. Honestly, if she found out about this, she'd be mad and threaten to kick me out, but she'd get over it. She's been loosening up about these things lately, and she wasn't the one who really cared about this stuff to begin with. Which brings me to the other topic I wanted to discuss. Your psycho dad. Yeah. You don't have to worry about him anymore. I don't want to make light of what your family went through, but it was obviously a relief to you, for good reason. You're free of him. Embrace that. I know, but the things he said and did sticks with me. It's all replaying in my head tonight. 
I can imagine. I was raised around plenty of double standards too, but I'm so fucking lucky my parents never sent me to Jesus camp or Turbo Jesus camp in your case. Heck, I didn't even know what a purity ball was until you showed me that abominable picture. It's so fucked up. He just ingrained it in me that my self-worth depended on some bogus idea of purity, and he ensured that every authority figure in my life said the same thing. And I assume that's what's bothering you now, the things you grew up hearing. Yeah, it's like, when someone insults you, it still hurts, even when you know for an absolute fact that it isn't true. I think about the sheer volume of people I've been around who judge the shit out of me for what I just did. If dad were around, he'd do a lot more than insult me. No joke, he'd disown me. Then he'd fucking hurt me and Aaron too. Impulsively, my hand went to the stretch of skin under my chin that I'd had to cover with turtlenecks for weeks. Hannah had been the only person I'd shown the bruise to and it had taken me enormous effort to convince her not to call law enforcement. I'd understood something that Hannah hadn't, that if a member of our small town's police force came by, they'd sooner believe whatever lie my dad told them than the truth. But you didn't do anything wrong, Hannah insisted, and your dad isn't going to hurt you or Aaron for that matter. He's in the same place he's been for a while, and he's not going anywhere else anytime soon. Of course, Hannah was right, and I told her as much. I need to stop worrying. It's just that, like, I can't shake the feeling that he's here somehow. Maria, he isn't there. You're safe. Do whatever you need to do to convince yourself of that. If you need me to come over, I can do that. No, it's okay. I'm feeling better. You should go to bed. Thanks for taking my call. Of course, you and Aaron have so many great experiences ahead of you and there's nothing anyone else can do about it. Focus on that. I left the call feeling reassured. Hannah was a good friend, and this was hardly the first time she'd been there for me. I spent a few minutes reading articles Hannah sent to me, which contained very basic, surface-level advice I wish I'd been exposed to prior to tonight, before leaning back on our soft living room sofa and closing my eyes. I'll just rest here for a minute, I told myself, and then I'll slip into bed with Aaron. At long last, I felt relaxed and at ease. The sound of a scream caused me to jump to my feet. To my surprise, a trail of dark, muddy footprints had stained the nearby carpet. They formed a path that led to the foot of the upper staircase. Whoever had made these tracks had gone upstairs and had the scream been errands. I ran, hastily, to the foot of the staircase. Before heading up, I dialed 911. Upon seeing that my call had been answered, I stuttered that someone was in my house and that my boyfriend was in danger. To my shock, the only sound that came from the other end of the call was sickly, taunting laughter. A deep, recognizable voice echoed from the top of the stairs. Nobody's going to help you. I dropped my phone as the sight of the figure standing above sent a paralyzing shock throughout me. Dad's tall, well-built body towered over me, and he appeared unexpectedly strong and healthy. Come to Papa, he commanded. When he opened his arms, I noticed that his outfit, the same formal black suit I'd last seen him in, was caked in a fresh layer of blood. What did you do to Aaron? I bellowed. Nothing worse than what he did to you, Dad taunted, robbing you of what little value you had left. I fumed with anger. I wanted to charge at him, to fight him, to at least try to save Aaron if he was still alive. But, instead, I ran. I scrambled for the front door, frantically undoing the locks while praying that dad wouldn't catch up to me. When I opened it, I found myself somehow face to face with my tormentor, who displayed a ghoulish smile. I woke up covered in sweat. To my relief, I realized that I'd simply dozed off on the sofa. According to the grandfather clock near me, it was close to 1.30 in the morning. There were no stains on the carpet, my dad wasn't here, and neither me nor my slumbering boyfriend were in any danger. Everything's fine, I repeated to myself as my heart rate slowly regressed back to normal. I switched on the television, hoping that maybe some late night offerings would calm my nerves. Instead, the image that displayed presumably on the channel mom had last been watching was of a fire and brimstone preacher speaking at a pulpit. I quickly turned it off. My mind drifted to my surroundings. The ticking of the grandfather clock brought back childhood memories of playing with dolls on the carpet in front of it. I'd spend hours engrossed in my own imagination, doing my best to ignore the sounds of dad screaming at mom. I recalled what he often told me as he led me from there up to my bedroom, that God was always watching and listening, and that impure thoughts would send me straight to hell. If you stray from the path of God, even just in your head, he'd say as I lay under the covers, then there won't be any room for you in his kingdom. Just the fire, screaming, and misery of hell. For years, I fought to suppress any thoughts or feelings, no matter how 
how fleeting on topics dad had declared unholy. I even chided myself over the content of my own dreams, begging God's forgiveness if my unconscious mind strayed onto subjects like sex or masturbation. I didn't want to burn, after all. Dad's bullying wasn't just psychological, as the physical scars on me and mom too proved. I remembered him calling us to the kitchen table after returning from work. Later, I learned that he'd been passed over for a promotion that day, but he didn't share that with us at the time. Instead, he'd slowly removed his belt and placed it on the table. He looked at me, then tilted his head back towards mom. He'd repeated this several times before announcing his decision. Maria, tonight's your lucky night. Go on now to your room. I'd obeyed, burying my head under my pillow in a futile effort to drown out the screams from below. I returned to the kitchen. It was at this table that dad had first revealed to me that he'd been reading my diary. I was in seventh grade, and I'd been writing in it for over a year. You thought you could hide it from me, couldn't you? Hide what? I'd asked, feigning ignorance. Jeffrey Vinson, your little boyfriend. The one I see everywhere but church. The one who's rotten, lustful eyes walk all over you. My face had grown red, and I'd started breathing rapidly. No, Dad, it's not like you think. All we've done is hold hands. You think I'm stupid, is that it? No, it's just... Whore, he'd called me, not for the first time. Worthless, just like your mother. When he told me what he wanted me to do, I begged and sobbed for nearly an hour. It had been no use, Dad hadn't budged. He never did. Instead, he'd taken my phone, dialed Jeffrey's number, and then placed it in front of me. When Jeffrey picked up, I'd recited, through tears, what Dad had instructed me to say, that I didn't see the light of God in him, and that things between us were over. I had no choice in the matter, the punishment for disobeying, as Dad had explained it, would be meted out not just to me, but to Jeffrey, too. Understandably, Jeffrey hadn't taken it well. I'd never really talked to him again. Dad, meanwhile, saw to it to punish me even further, all but restricting me from ever being alone with any other member of the opposite sex. Dad wasn't coming for me, I reminded myself. Hannah had said the same thing. I pondered Hannah's next words, do whatever you need to do to convince yourself of that. An idea dawned on me, one that could bring the closure I sought. Fuck it, I thought, for the second time that night, before slipping on a pair of tennis shoes, grabbing a jacket, and stepping into the cool breeze outside. It took my eyes a moment to get used to the darkness. It was well after midnight, after all, and we lived on the outskirts of town. My destination was only a short walk away. At this hour, I'd normally drive, but, as I'd technically be intruding, I figured I'd best make the trip on foot to avoid attracting the attention of any patrolman on night duty. The first thing I did was stop by dad's shed. We'd sold much of what he'd kept in there, but a few things remained. Several open paint cans, a worn felling axe, a broken lawnmower, and the LED flashlight I was looking for. The shortest path was reachable from the backyard and stretched through the surrounding woods. Mom, Dad, and I had regularly used it to get to Sunday service so long as it wasn't covered by mud or snow. But, as the trail was barely visible even during the daylight, I opted instead to use the longer but more discernible route alongside the nearby streets. I kept the flashlight aimed a few feet ahead of me as I trudged along the dirt roads on uneven surface. My surroundings, which consisted of dense forest punctuated only occasionally by the driveways and yards of neighboring homes, were eerily quiet. Everything looked bleak and uninviting at night, and I imagined, but fortunately did not encounter coyotes peering out at me at every turn. Finally, the tallest spire of the Cedar Hill Church of Christ appeared in the distance, barely visible in the light cast by the first quarter moon. I hadn't been there since the funeral, despite mom's efforts to convince me to attend service with her, something she'd only stopped doing once she started seeing a new boyfriend a few weeks ago. It was a place where the minister regularly preached about sin, damnation, and moral rot, instilling in me fears and prejudices that I still struggled to overcome. I recalled how, during Sunday school, we were separated by sex. During the sessions that followed, our instructors compared women who didn't save themselves for marriage with a good Christian man, of course, to totaled cars or disgusting pieces of gum that had already been chewed by several people. We were told that if we didn't dress modestly, we were responsible for men who looked at us and couldn't control their impulses. I approached the church. The cemetery 
three gates were locked at this hour, so with a grunt, I carefully pulled myself up and over the short cobblestone wall that lined its eastern perimeter, landing on a patch of grass on the other side. The cemetery had an unexpectedly peaceful ambience to it. As I shined my flashlight over various headstones, I pictured the inhabitants of the coffins underneath them, resting quietly in a deep, dreamless sleep that fit with the soothing serenity of the quiet night. Just a little bit further, I told myself, doing my best to remember the grave's exact position, and I'll get the closure I need. Finally, my light shined on a vaguely familiar name carved across a flat plaque. I recognized it as the starting point of the row that led to my dad's grave. I took a deep breath before trudging along. I knew what lay ahead, a plain, upright granite headstone that displayed in carved letters, his name, the dates of this birth and death, and a blatant lie about him being a devoted father and husband. I'd look at it, remind myself of what Hannah had told me. He's in the same place he's been for a while, and he's not going anywhere else anytime soon, and, with my irrational fears finally quelled, head on home. I pictured myself soon crawling into bed, holding on to Aaron, and enjoying several hours of the restful sleep that had thus far eluded me. But when I approached the grave, nothing was as I'd expected. My first thought was that someone had vandalized it. Deep, ugly marks cut through much of the headstone's surface. Looking closer, I realized that someone had crudely scratched alterations to the text. I gasped as I saw that my own name had been crossed out and replaced by a new, profane term such that the last word of the phrase beloved father of Maria had been replaced with horror. I dropped my flashlight in shock. When I bent to pick it up, I discovered something far more unsettling. The dirt beneath the headstone, the ground where my father had been buried, had somehow been partially dug up. Peering into it, I made out a dark, very narrow hole that led at least several feet into the ground. What the hell is happening, I thought, as I backed up from the desecrated site. I'd never heard of grave robbers in our town, and there was no reason for his burial place, in particular, to be targeted. We weren't rich, and he wasn't buried with anything valuable. Most strikingly, the hole itself just didn't seem to be the result of someone shoveling from above. Rather, the dirt looked like it had been clawed out by hand, and the gap was just wide enough for someone to slip through, almost like someone had dug out from below. I grew dizzy with confusion and realized too late that I was losing my balance. Images of memorial crosses, granite benches, and slanted headstones flashed around me as I sprawled to the ground. I cried, not because of pain from the fall. Fortunately, I'd mostly landed on soft grass, but from the sheer misery I felt. Dad wasn't down there anymore. He was back, just like in my dream. As impossible as it sounded, I sensed that it was true. Not even death itself could stop him from judging and policing my life. I had no doubt why this was happening tonight, or where he was going. I jumped to my feet, hopped back over the wall, and ran towards the path back home through the woods. I didn't care about the roots I stumbled over, the predators that might be watching me, or the fresh footprints that seemed headed towards my house. I just needed to get home as fast as possible. When I emerged into my backyard, the patio door was wide open and the rock next to it, under which we kept a spare key, had been overturned. Dad was here. My heart throbbed in fear as I stepped inside. Following a trail of soil and grime through the kitchen, I found myself at the foot of the staircase, where I looked up to see a tall form encased almost entirely in shadow. Unlike in my dream, he hadn't yet reached my room. The figure paused, seemingly having sensed my presence, and turned towards me. Although the darkness continued to cover most of his features, I could see his body shaking with what I imagined to be a spiteful rage. The raspy voice was unmistakably my father's, if slightly deeper and rougher than I remembered. Daddy's girl has been bad. I responded as firmly as I could manage. Leave me alone. I shivered as he took one step down towards me. You promised you would be a woman of character, of purity, until the day came when God guided you to your husband. He took another step, and I recited my own promise, that I would lead you to that day and protect you along the way from all who wish to diminish you, like the sinner who lays in your bed at this very moment. He was close to me now. I wanted to fight back, or at least to scream and warn Aaron, but I felt frozen, paralyzed. I'd never fought back against dad before. He was bigger than me and he was so much stronger. You broke your word, he hissed. You made a liar of me. I was going to punish him first. 
but I see that you need to learn your lesson now. You can't be trusted in this life, not without me around. So I'm going to have to take you back with me to the next one. In a sudden burst of speed, he lunged forward, jumping several steps at once. I ran. I burst out the door where, thankfully, dad wasn't waiting for me as he had been in my dream, and sprinted into the woods. What happened next passed as a blur. I recall hopping stumps, bushes, and roots, falling, getting up, falling again. Eventually, when I was out of breath, I dropped to the ground, crawled next to a fallen tree, and curled up in a ball. I'd done this so many times before, hidden away from him, in a cupboard, under the stairs, in the narrow space between a bookcase and the wall. I'd hoped his anger would pass, that, in the morning, he'd have forgotten about whatever imaginary transgression had enraged him. Sometimes, I'd get lucky and he would, in fact, forget. But I was never free of him, and it was never long before the next time he snapped. Maria, he called. He was in the woods, though not particularly close to me. Come back, Maria. Daddy's calling you. It'll hurt less if you give up now. I shuddered. I'm in a good hiding spot. All I have to do is wait here, I tried telling myself. But what good would that do? He'd still be looking for me, and if he couldn't find me, he'd go back for Aaron. This had to stop, I realized, and I had to be the one to stop it. I couldn't do that by being a coward. I got up as quietly as I could. Keeping low, I crept carefully back towards the house. When my dad's voice next rang out, it came from less than a few yards away. Maria, come to Papa, he repeated. I held my breath as I leaned against a thick oak tree that I used for cover. I waited there for several moments until the shuffling sounds of movement drifted far in the opposite direction. When I reached my property, I went straight for Dad's shed, where I took hold of the only weapon available to me. I can do this, I told myself as I gripped the axe with two shaking hands. I needed a plan. If I played my cards right, surprise would be on my side. Dad expected me to hide, not to fight, after all. I took my position behind the large rocking chair in the living room. As I'd hoped, the kitchen light I'd flipped on drew Dad in from outside. From a narrow gap between the chair's cushions and the wall, I watched as his dark silhouette stepped through the back door. His head bent down as he gazed upon the dirty shoe prints I'd left for him, which led into the kitchen cupboard. Found your hiding spot, darling. It wasn't a great ruse, and I knew that he wouldn't be fooled for long. I only had a moment to act. Gathering my courage, I stood up and stepped silently across the carpeted floor as dad reached for the handle for the door. As he opened it, I held the axe above my head. Mustering my courage, I swung its blade into his back with all my might. I'd assume the figure stalking me resembled the antagonist from one of those movies Hannah had shown me, movies during which I covered my eyes for much of the runtime. An evil being that possessed superhuman strength, even invincibility, who hacked and slashed his way through his victims, and who could only be defeated by, well, somebody with whom I no longer shared a critical quality. But something strange happened when I ran the axe through my undead dad's back, it easily severed his skin, not quite like a knife through warm butter, but close. He whimpered and abruptly collapsed. Wormrid and sod spilled out of the gap I'd made in him, falling in clumps across the kitchen floor. I watched, my jaw dropped, as he crawled away from me out into the backyard. Not wanting to miss my chance to finish him off, to end this, I ran after him and pulled the axe out of him. When he raised his head to look at me, he wasn't the strong, muscular man I remembered, nor the threatening figure from my dream. Instead, he was frail and weak, held together only by brittle bone and bits of flimsy, heavily decomposed flesh. Maria, he mumbled, more worms falling out of his mouth as he spoke. I love you. Don't. With a shriek, I swung the axe again, this time digging a long gash into his shoulder blade that severed his right arm from the rest of his body. What the fuck is wrong with you? I screamed, my anger over what he'd done to me, to mom, boiling over. Why are you so fucking obsessed with, with nonsense? I was 11 years when you made me make that stupid pledge. 11. Maria, daddy's girl, don't do this. He raised his left arm futilely in an attempt to shield himself from my blows. I'm an adult. Why do you give a shit who I chose to sleep with, or when. It's none of your goddamn business, you fucking pervert. I let out an animalistic cry as I swung again and again. When I calmed down, Dad's body lay before me in pieces, a knee here, a hand there. At the center of it all was his skeletal head, and it appeared stuck in a permanent expression of agonized disapproval. Roughly two hours later, I pulled up to the cemetery in my old sedan. I knew I was taking a risk. 
The sun was peeking over the horizon, and if someone saw me, there'd simply be no way to explain what I was doing. But I wasn't going to walk again, not after what I'd been through, and not in light of what I needed to bring with me. My hands covered by thick work gloves, I lifted each garbage bag from the trunk and tossed them over the wall. Once I reached the other side, I carried them to Dad's grave, where I dropped them into the hole and pushed them until they slid down to the cedar coffin below. With his joints disconnected and in separate bags, Dad was wasn't going to crawl back up again. Using the shovel I'd brought with me, I sealed the hole's narrow entrance with the dirt that had been knocked loose around it. Last, I patted the dirt as neatly as I could to cover any signs that a hole had been there in the first place. I couldn't fix the altered headstone, but with any luck the authorities would conclude that nothing had happened beyond some superficial vandalism. There'd be no reason to do anything to the grave other than replace the headstone. I'd probably be questioned, but I wouldn't fall under any suspicion. I had no reason to carve an obscenity over my own name, after all. At home, I cleaned up much of the mess dad had made until nothing remained but a few stains on the carpet. Finally, I stepped into the shower where, under hot water, I scrubbed off the layer of sweat, dirt, and filth that, by this point, had covered my body. When I stepped out, I stared at myself in the bathroom mirror, slowly taking in the fact that the face looking back at me belonged to a fundamentally different person than before. For so long, I'd assumed that sex would change me, that it would set in motion some grand new phase of my existence, but that hadn't happened at all. Rather, I'd left that experience as meek, confused, and afraid as before. What had changed me was, well, I think that's obvious by now. I dried myself off, threw on some night clothes and, at long last, crawled into bed where I wrapped my arms around Aaron. I tried to be gentle but Aaron nonetheless stirred and yawned when I touched him. He turned towards me, his face lighting up at my sight. Good morning, he murmured in a drowsy voice. Looks like you showered. Yeah, sorry to wake you. It's fine, he said. I slept so well. How about you? I shook my head. Sorry to hear that. It's alright, I replied. Look, I, um, he said, pausing to yawn. I wanted to talk to you about last night. Okay, I just, um, I want to say that, like, it means a lot to me to have shared that experience with you. I know it didn't happen the way we thought it would, but I, I'm glad that we did that. I felt myself grow a little red as I tightened my grip around him into a light embrace. It means a lot to me too, but I uh, also want to talk about something I'm feeling, um, kind of guilty about. Oh, alright. For a moment, I braced myself for a confession I desperately did not want to hear that last night had been a mistake, that we'd sinned, or that we needed to repent. But, thankfully, the words that followed were quite different. It's just that, it may have meant a lot to us both emotionally, you know. But, like, I know you didn't get a lot out of it in other ways. Physically, I mean. It's okay, I said, a blush overtaking my face. Neither of us knew what we were doing. It's normal for it be like that. No, I mean, it shouldn't be normal. You deserve to enjoy it too, just as much as I do. I just want to say that, like, moving forward, if there's anything I can do to make it better for you, then I want to do that. I had a few ideas about that, thanks to the material Hannah had sent me earlier. I nodded as a warm feeling spread through me, one of comfort and trust. Thank you. I love you, Maria. I love you too. I kissed him on the forehead. For a moment, the events of the night swam through my mind. I was exhausted, and I'd soon be sore all over. I'd witnessed unnatural, horrifying things, and I'd been afraid for my life more than once. I had every reason to spend the day alone, processing what had happened. But, I was a new person now, someone who embraces herself, who faces her anxieties instead of running from them. I felt alive in a way that I'd never felt before. I glanced at the clock behind him. It was only a little past 7 in the morning. Mom wouldn't be back from her boyfriend's for at least another hour. I looked back at Aaron. A mischievous smile spread across his face, just as I felt one spread across mine. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? He asked. I nodded. Yes, I am. I kissed him again before whispering gently, I think it's time for round two. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacey, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.